This is the first time we're doing this in public, so bear with us for a little while. <clears throat> We've presented this for the troop, um, but this is the first time we're doing it in public. Um, I will like to introduce four of the scouts that came with us on the trek. Uh, my son, Jeffrey. Wadey Jacoby, my son. Uh, Chris Paul and Mike. You know, we have a few pictures of Mike. We'll be pointing him out in a couple pictures. So, <laughs> but he, uh, he, He's the character of the bunch. Thank you all for coming, and I want to th uh, thank the Penfield Trails Committee. Uh, we want to uh, uh, grow in our relationship with you, and uh, I guess this is fate that we're here uh, on Valentine's Day. So happy Valentine's Day to everybody. Happy Valentine's Day. And before, before we begin the slideshow, I'd just like to uh, read something from this uh, uh, Philmont guide that we were all given before we went on our trip. Uh, it's just a little uh, blurb on the challenge that we faced when we went down there. Philmont means more than just a series of scenic mountain camps or a collection of exciting programs. It's more than just a physical challenge. It is an experience in living together, cooperating with others under sometimes difficult circumstances. It is learning to surmount the challenges of hiking and camping at high altitudes and learning to live in harmony with nature. You may get soaked to the skin uh, in, in downpours. You will breathe harder and faster ever than you did before in climbing a ridge or a mountain. And after that, you may even burn your supper, but you will make it. Though there may be times when you feel as though you can go no further. So with that, let's begin. We're going to start with a little bit of history of Philmont, tell you a little bit about the the camp. Philmont Scout Ranch is the world's largest youth camp. Okay. It's rugged, mountainous, uh, located near the town of Cimarron, New Mexico, covers approximately 137,000 acres. Okay. It's about 214 square miles. And they'll tell you when you get there, there's about one bear per square mile at Philmont. Uh, it's in the Sangre de Cristo Mountains of the Rocky Mountains in northern New Mexico. There are 315 miles of trails, uh, 34 staffed camps, and a total of 770 campsites on the, on the, the ranch. It has over 1,500 deer, 300 elk, 40 to 60 antelope, 100 to 150 bears, and about 22,000 scouts per summer go through this camp. This gentleman is Wait Phillips. Wait Phillips was the younger brother of the two brothers that started Phillips Petroleum. Philmont exists mainly because of this man. Um, he and his wife owned the camp or the, the ranch and decided after having some scouts that had used his property, he liked the program and donated some property to the scouts. This area here that's shaded that was the original land grant that he gave to the Boy Scouts. Okay. That was back in 1938. Okay. At that time, for, these, for the first summer, it cost a dollar per week per camper. We'll tell you what we paid later. There's a little more than that. Um, and after he observed the enthusiastic response, he donated more property, this large area here. That was his second gift to the scouts. And then later on in the, I think it was 1963, they actually purchased this area here to make the camp the final size that it is now. However, since then, this area in the northeast or northwest, uh, that is state land and the scouts are allowed to use it. They have camps there. And what the scouts have to do in order to keep using it is each scout that is in there does three hours of trail work or trail construction, trail maintenance while they're camping there. And then also in this area here, there's an area that they're allowed to use. It's owned by some guy from Atlanta that owns a baseball team. Um, and he allows him to use his ranch. <coughs> You're up next. And, and that, that, that gentleman's name is Ted Turner. Yeah. Um, 
So, so this is uh, something we saw in one of the museums down there as we were preparing for our hike and spending some downtime. Uh, if you'll note, the cost of a total trip was back in 1930s, $18. Uh, just to give you an, aver uh, an idea of what we spent per scout, uh, it was about, all said, about $900. Uh, camp was 460 and uh, travel down there by Amtrak train, which I highly recommend, allows you to see the country um, via Chicago. Travel was about 350 uh, for a round trip. And of course you had the meals and the spending money, uh, but this is quite a, uh, quite a jump from, from the day and, and uh, just wanted to capture that and, and uh, show you. And this is our crew. Uh, we were eight scouts. Uh, this is at the, um, at the Amtrak station, late at night, Friday night, getting ready to uh, get out of town. And uh, four advisors. So we were a full crew, and we, we uh, earned an award for that. That was the, uh, the, the full crew award. <laughs> uh, next slide. That's right. Our wives were there seeing us off. And, and we um, did leave about three and a half hours late. <laughs> Actually, uh, when we, uh, we, we scheduled a trip to Dodge City, Kansas, to uh, uh, stop and tour the place for a good 24 hours. Uh, this was our train station. We pulled in about uh, 4.45 a.m. And we were escorted by the local camp uh, uh, hostess for uh, uh, getting our bags and ourselves transported to the local campsite. Uh, she went, she made about four trips for us uh, when she heard we were uh, a scout troop. We called ahead and she was wonderful. While we were there, we went to the Dodge City Museum. Dodge City is the town that the show Gunsmoke is based on, believe it or not. Um, there was a Miss Kitty that ran a saloon in Dodge City. It was literally on the western edge of the United States. Uh, the 100th Meridian runs through Dodge City, and that was the western edge of the Louisiana Purchase. As you can see, they had a little trouble. You know, they, they were playing cards. They, they had a little trouble. One of the scouts decided that he wanted to, like, put cards up his sleeves. And the funny thing about this is when they had this picture taken, the photographer said, okay, which one of you is most likely to cheat? <laughs> this scout said me, and all the rest of them said James. <laughs> Um, but the one thing about, and I'm going to embarrass my son here, we all had fun at Dodge City, but some of us had more fun than others. Uh, we convinced him that it was his birthday, so they called him up on stage, plopped a can-can girl in his lap, and sang him happy birthday. I think this one's yours, Ken. Is it? Well, this is, this is uh, our final destination off of the Amtrak train, and this is a town called Raton, New Mexico. Uh, this is where we depart and take a bus ride to, uh, to, to the Philmont Ranch. And, and this, this slide to me kind of speaks a little bit to the sadness of the rail system is they had this beautiful building here. That's the train station. <laughs> this building here is open for the bathrooms and that's it. Everything else is done out of this little metal hut they built right next to the, to the building. Okay, this, for a little bit of history, this is Via Filmonte. This was Waite Phillips and his wife's Genesee's summer cottage. It was about 28,400 feet of summer cottage. Uh, when he donated the last chunk of property, he actually donated the house to the Boy Scouts also. And it's now a museum. All his original furniture is in there. Um, and it's really a fun place to go. Now, when they donated the, the, the property, the Boy Scouts said, wow, this is great. We can't afford it. So Wade Phillips also donated an office building downtown Tulsa, Oklahoma, and said, well, you can have this building, use the rents from the building to upkeep the camp. Uh, they've since sold the building, but the money they made from selling that office building is still paying for the, for the camp. Uh, this actually sitting at the piano, this is uh, Wadey Jacoby. 
He played the piano. We didn't tell him how much it was worth when he played it. We waited till afterwards. That's actually a player grand piano that was owned by White Phillips and his wife. Uh, and I remember correctly, the value of that is about $250,000 in that range. It's completely restored, very recently restored. This is a window that's in the upper landing of the, the house. And it actually, it's, it, it's a, it shows the, the history of the, the Santa Fe Trail. The Native Americans in the front, the wagon train in the back. There are a few errors, though. There are some saguaro cactus in there, which are not in this area. And also, the, the wagons are being pulled by horses. And the wagons on the Santa Fe Trail would actually have been pulled by, by oxen. But it's absolutely, it's a, and it's hand painted. And then downstairs, when the house was finished, they had a week-long housewarming party. And this table's in the basement. And Wade Phillips and his brothers and his friends decided, hey, let's carve our initials in our table. And the date's there, July 4th, uh, 1927. And the story is his wife was so angry, she had a tablecloth made for this table and covered the table. And it wasn't until a I think they said about 10 years ago, that someone actually took the tablecloth off and discovered this in the, in the table, that, that the camp didn't even know the initials were there. So uh, a little bit about what, what happens when you arrive at camp. Uh, you're, you're quite busy. You're, you're received by the welcoming center, and you're uh, shown your, your overnight base camp uh, tents and you're moving in and you're checking in and then things quiet down and your, uh, your scout troop is uh, given the, the uh, opportunity to go to one of four services. Uh, they, they have uh, Catholic, Jewish, Latter-day Saints and Protestant services and these are the overlooks that you experience when you, when you get out there in the service, the evening service. Mountains as far as you can see, wild horses grazing, even deer checking in on you, and uh, just a beautiful scenic uh, view of the, uh, the mountains. What was the temperature? The temperature was quite nice. It was August, and uh, we were probably in the range between 60 and 85 degrees daily. At night, it got cold. Uh, it got to be reaching the freezing mark in some cases. So. This, is, uh, this is a scene of a rock mesa that I believe, well, it's called Yuraka Mesa. Okay. And uh, as a kid, uh, when Hugh first went to Philmont, he stayed on the top of that mes mesa. That's, that's where we stayed our last night on trail when I went as a scout. It's red. That's the sun reflecting off of it. That's, it's not a red rock, but that's the sun at sunset. Just a gorgeous view. And these are the tents that we actually stayed in in base camp. They're a platform tent with cots. Standard Boy Scout issued mountain man tents. Uh, another quite spectacular view of uh, the moon rising. Setting. Is it setting? Yep. Uh, I, I, I remember it well. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and and this, this is one of our, our destinations. Actually, the last, the last uh, day, this is called the Tooth of Time. And you can see the tooth jutting out of its little cusp of its, its gums. And that's actually uh, out in the distance. It's not part of that mountain, but it's behind it. And that's uh, something we'll talk about a little bit later. Just an amazing picture, though. And there we are, ready to embark. And before they do that, they take a photo of us. And uh, you'll notice uh, a little bit of a tradition developing. Uh, our one scout on the left is uh, very enthusiastic and ready to go. That's Mike. And he's uh, posing extra special. Um, 
we'll get, we'll, we'll see more of that, I'm sure, right? It actually became known as striking a mic. So when we started taking pictures, all the scouts would do that pose. Uh, I mentioned 12, a full crew, and this is our ranger, Brandon Smart. Uh, he took care of us for the first couple days. Uh, we'll talk more about him later. Sorry, what was that? What elevations? There's a, there's a, we'll a slide, and we'll talk very specifically about the yeah, elevations. Um, so, Philmont uh, takes very good care of you. They issue, in, if you're in need, tents, dining tarps, cooking supplies, cooking hardware, uh, and food. And this is our crew getting ready and receiving their, their uh, food. And you can see that the food is bagged in, uh, we have some samples in the back tables, uh, high caloric uh, energy food for the trail. And even though uh, it doesn't seem like a lot, they gave us enough to have us carry extras back. Uh, so it's a very uh, weight, um, you're, you're very conscious about the weight of this food. It's not light. So there's cans of tuna, cans of uh, peanut butter spread, uh, like high caloric energy uh, lifting food. And that's about four days worth. That's about half of our trek worth. And no fussy eaters. And no fussy eaters. <laughs> Can't be any fussy eaters on it. We did have allergies to work with. And the scouts worked amongst themselves to trade uh, their meals and their items and their meals, and it worked out fine. This is a sample menu of our last day on the trail, day six. Uh, actually, it, it probably wasn't our last day. The, the numbers correspond to the number of the day in the trek sequence that you're on. It's not necessarily the day that you're, that you're, you're day six, but it's day six in the sequence. It's a lot like school and you have a day one, you miss a class. And anyway, um, high caloric, energy giving food, um, and a lot of it. And again, like I said, we were carrying that. It was probably about a third of our weight at the beginning when they're, when they're issuing your food. And then it slowly gets lighter. <laughs> and, and you notice they're not necessarily traditional meals, beef jerky for breakfast, you know, high protein. Yeah, high protein. This is actually the entrance, the, the sign they have there at the camp, uh, the crew underneath. And you notice along the top, one of the traditions is kids get off the trail, they tie their boots together, and they throw it over the top of the sign, try to get them to stay there. Um, I didn't do that. I needed my shoes to wear home. But, you know. <clears throat> and uh, there's Mike. There's Mike. Yep. He, he's got the, we're going to pick on Mike a little bit. <laughs> this year was pretty special for Philmont. They had the one millionth scout somewhere in there, visitors of 24,000 this summer. So what they did was the weekend that, or the week that they thought they had the one millionth scout, they didn't, I don't think they singled him out, but they, they actually gave the whole uh, attending scouts the, the patch for the one millionth scout. Um, that's a lot of trekkers in, what, 80 years? Yeah. yeah. This is a, actually uh, during a, a camp out or a, uh, fire, a campfire. And during this campfire, they gave us a bit of history on the camp, uh, enact, enactments and things like that, uh, reenactments. And during the middle of the show, all of a sudden, this red, fiery red moon started to rise over, over the back. And everybody's attention was drawn over to the side. And the, the reenactors were like, hey, this show's here. <laughs> it was, <laughs> but, it was uh, actually the night of the supermoon It was the rising night of the in August. Moon. Amazing. So you had a question about uh, elevations. Um, the trek went as follows. This is a this was a seven day trek. Uh, when when Philmont uh, trekkers go and traditionally they may attend a twelve day trek. These are recently offered uh, seven day treks to get probably more people in the later part of the season to go. And that's what we chose to do. We chose a strenuous trek. There's 
challenging, rugged, and strenuous. And we went right for the strenuous, and I'll tell you why. It's because that was one of the few that offered black powder rifles. <laughs> Naturally, they skipped right over the strenuous and went for black powder rifles. Um, and we, we, we worked hard. The day, day one was a break-in day, and we started at six, maybe six, 65,000, 6,500, and uh, walked for two miles, broke our gear in. Day two took us on uh, a increase in elevation of about 1,600 feet within two miles. It's traditionally called the Stairmaster. Stairmaster? Yes. And it is a, a, basically you're going up a 30% grade and for two miles you are tested and you are huffing and puffing it. Uh, day three, and that took us to about, um, well, 1,600 about miles, 1,600 feet above that. And uh, day three, we were hanging out uh, probably about 9,000 feet and we trekked 11 miles. So now we're starting to get our game on. Uh, a lot of us had to resort to the, the walking poles, uh, both scouts and leaders, and those helped a lot. Day five took us to uh, uh, lots of elevation climbing, and uh, we peaked out at Mount Phillips, and uh, that is an elevation of 11,700 feet. Um, there's not much grows up there. It's, it's beautiful. You can see for miles. Um, and then a couple other peaks uh, on day six. Back to the Tooth of Time, which you saw pictures of, which is at 99,000. And uh, then back to the, through the Trail of Tears, uh, back to base camp. They call it the Trail of Tears because it's your last day. You want to get back to base camp. It's about 11 to 12 miles uh, from your previous campsite and you can see in the distance base camp and you go along a long switch back and then it disappears base camp disappears and then you come back and, and it reappears but it's not really that much closer <laughs> and you do that for about nine or ten times and the, the kids and the adults start to cry and then you see a deer carcass that was uh, attacked by a mountain lion. And you think, is this my fate? Or am I going to make it? And, you, and, and we had actually an injury, a, a small injury, where we were really struggling to get, uh, to get back. Uh, and the person that had that uh, made it. We all made it. And uh, thankfully, we uh, dried our tears and um, had supper. All right. <clears throat> Now, this is a funny looking photo, but there is a purpose to it. That is an outhouse that all the boys, there are eight, nine young men standing in that outhouse, and they do this for a reason. Okay? There's a rule at Philmont, and I don't mean to be crass, um, but outhouses are for doing one thing, rocks are for peeing on. You don't pee in the outhouses because that allows them to break down naturally. They don't smell. Did that smell? Not at all did not smell at all. And by doing that, it allows them to stay cleaner. The biology works and breaks down the, the, the refuse. Now, when Wade Phillips donated the property, that yes? The What's that? that? That didn't explain why they're all in the same building? Oh, oh, just that they were all standing <laughs> in the outhouse and it didn't smell. Oh, okay. that's, that's what they wanted to no, experience. No. No, 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 no. That's, that's where the ranger like that. does his, he has them all crowd into that outhouse and say, okay, what don't you smell? Okay. So that's why they were all crowded in there. Now, when, when Wade Phillips donated the property, he had two basic stipulations. One, it had to remain a working ranch. So this is a working cattle and horse ranch. Okay. You can actually go on a trek to work the horse ranch. His other stipulation is any of his relatives, whenever they want to visit, they're allowed to visit. And they do go back and visit. I think his grandson goes back every year now. There we are, ready to go. Uh, we're, we're ready to take our first step on our trek. They dropped us off in a bus, and the bus took off. And they're like, uh, 
starting to realize that reality is hitting them and they have this challenge ahead of them. <laughs> this is an interesting picture of, we, had, we did many of these uh, bridge crossings. Uh, what we had to do was unbuckle our belts and loosen our uh, straps in case we fell into the water. We didn't want to drown, we wanted to get out quickly. And uh, the last man over had to yell, last man over. And um, there was a method to it, one person at a time. This is, this is our uh, first camp, and this is uh, affectionately called Camp Chaos. What, what you see over here is us preparing immediately the bear bags, filling them with food, preparing dinner, uh, packs strewn all over the place, and our ranger is just going, boy, we have a lot to teach you. <laughs> and, uh, and he did, and they learned, and they uh, gradually got better at it, and, um, but this is camping, and this is what it was all about. Uh, the question is, did we protect the food from the animals? And that's exactly what we did. We, those bear bags were stuffed with not only food, but our, all of our smellables, uh, chapstick, deodorant, anything that uh, smelled, we had to put them in that bag and haul them up in a tree in a cable system. And that's to keep the bears away from where we slept. This is, this is a picture of some of the boys halfway up the Stairmaster. We were probably, and this was probably about halfway through the day's hike. Uh, we stopped for a snack and for lunch, um, and that's where they, Chris was trying to hide in the first picture, and I waited for him to stand up, and I got him the second time. He tried hard, but he, I, I got him anyway. So uh, before we left, we told everybody that we were going to Philmont, everybody brothers, sisters, parents, um, cousins. And so this is us, and this is a, uh, a group going the opposite way, and they had t-shirts on saying where they were from. They were from Pittsford. And uh, you don't see a lot of people in these mountains. You're spread out pretty far, so the chance to see somebody is a chance to talk to, to another group of people and visit, and uh, they called out my name. They said, we're looking for Ken Jacoby, and uh, I said, I know who you are. You're the other trek that we were told about was going to be up there. My, my brother and sister-in-law work with this gentleman right here. And, and son of a gun, we saw him on the second day of our trek. And that was their sixth day of their trek. And we stopped and took a picture. That was the top of the Stairmaster for us. We had just finished coming up. They were about to go down. I would rather go up the Stairmaster than down. This is what graded us at the top of the Stairmaster. Just opened up into this absolutely gorgeous alpine meadow. <clears throat> and we got a group photo there too. Sadly, the group photos are all missing one person, and that was the guy behind the camera. That was me. Um, <laughs> I'm in one group photo, I think. But there's Mike. But there's Mike. <laughs> yep, there's Mike. Um, well, um, we were too tired. Well, <laughs> and Mike, I did not carry a small camera. I had a Nikon uh, D90, which is a fairly heavy camera with a fairly long lens. Um, it, when I go back, and I say when I go back, because I will go back, um, I'm going to find a smaller camera to carry. Well, we, we, this, this is, we thank you for these pictures, because most of these are, are from him and the other gentleman in the center took a lot of these. And like I said, it is a working cattle ranch. You had to watch where you stepped. Um, and you just walk through the fields. The cows would look at you saying, why are you here now? Uh, they drive the cattle up to this meadow in the springtime. They're there for the summer, and they come back in the fall, and they drive them back down to base camp in the, in the fall. What were the tree species? What were oh, the tree species? That's a question I can't answer very well because it depended a lot on where you are. Um, there were a lot of pines. Um, we saw some scrub oak um, yes. in the higher elevations. Um, most of this is pine forest. Yeah, if you look at it, yeah, there, there was you're far enough in altitude. There was a mix yep. of evergreen and decision. Yes. Yep. 
a lot of conifers. It's yep. Dry alpine tree zone. Yes. Yep. Uh, the, the base area where the ranch is is high desert grassland. So sometimes no trees except along the creek, just bushes and grass for 50 miles. And cactus. Yep. When you get up into the higher zones, in the alpine zones, you get the, the evergreens. Yep. Right. Now, people laugh at this this picture. But they warn you about the bears. These are the guys you got to watch out for. Yeah. Okay. Uh, at this point, the crew was down purifying water because we had to purify water, and I was sitting at camp because someone has to stay with the food. There were five of these guys running around because they're like, "Ooh, camps are campers. That means food." Um, he was actually—that's actually the hat he was sitting on, right there. Uh, he nibbled it a little bit until I talked to him, and then he stood up and looked at me like, why are you here? This is my house. Um, They're about twice the size of our chipmunks. Yes, literally. and very well fed. Very well fed. <laughs> yep. This is our ranger again. Um, and at this point, he's, he's doing a little demonstration on, you have to purify all your water. You can't just take it out of the stream. It is a working cattle ranch. Okay. Um, we had a physical pump that we used. We also had chlorine tablets. And this is what he's actually doing, is he's actually teaching the boys, this is what you do. Cut it open. Try to keep the package together, because this is a carry out. There are no trash cans along the trail. Any trash that you generate, you carry out with you. Okay. And he was a very good ranger. Um, taught the kids a lot. Taught them some things we wish he hadn't taught them. Um, but that's OK. Uh, it was all in fun. And he was actually a college student. And let me tell you, his job is horrible. He takes kids out camping for two days, walks back to base camp, has a night off, takes another group of kids out camping in the mountains for the next two days, walks back to, I would love to live my life like that. <laughs> love to live my life like that. All right, so this is uh, sort of explaining the ritual, the nightly ritual of uh, arriving at camp. And the first thing you do is you cable up a line with uh, your food and your smellables. And uh, that's called bear bagging it. And um, they, and be they became experts at this. And your smellables include your water bottles. If you mix a drink in your water bottle, it is now a smellable. If you mixed a drink in that water bottle two years ago, and had water in it since then, it's still considered a smellable. So one of the tricks that we were taught was rather than mixing your drink in your bottle, you would open up your powdered drink, pour a little bit on your tongue, take a swig of water, mix it in your mouth, and drink it. Okay. Great. It's a great way. Um, also, I mentioned before, deodorant is a smellable. And they restrict you from not using deodorant for the whole trip. Yep. So I mentioned that before. You can't even bring it on the trail. Don't even take it on trail. Excuse me. I'm trying to think of, oh, this is roses, buds, and thorns. Um, this, this was the opportunity uh, at, in the evening after dinner to reflect upon the day. And this is a tradition called roses, buds, and thorns. Uh, basically, everybody uh, takes a turn and says what they liked about the day, the roses. Uh, an op opportunity for them to vent a little bit, the, the thorns and buds, um, what they're looking forward to the next few days. And I believe one of the scouts, uh, this gentleman up here, one of his roses was the Stairmaster. That, that was his no, good it, it, he's, he, he's a glutton for punishment. He loves physical activity, uh, and that was, his, that was his rose. And his buds were climbing yes. uh, the yep. peaks of And just to, uh, Ken and I were two of the leaders. Uh, this gentleman here, uh, Sam Goodwin, is actually a troop leader for Troop 260 in Penfield. And he was also one of the crew leaders. And this is his and son. this gentleman here is Dave Paul, who is associated with Troop 310. And his son was also on the truck. And this is uh, Sam's son, That's Matt. Sam's son, Matt, yep. From Troop 3, 260. 260. Uh, we didn't have a full crew, so we opened it up and said, is there anyone who wants to go? And they were first come, first serve. So I think they enjoyed it. 
That was our camp that morning. Go ahead. Yeah, and uh, when we arrived at this camp, uh, we were greeted by a herd of uh, wild turkeys okay. and uh, a deer or two and, and then the cattle that were in the valley here. Uh, but that's waking up in the morning and um, it's just kind of a taste of the serenity and the, the scenic view. And uh, this, this is a picture of our ranger saying goodbye to our ranger on day two of the, the trek. Um, this was sort of a, a, a surreal um, view because he ain't going to help us anymore. We're on our own. And you're, you sort of swallow hard and you think, uh, we're going to do this next four days by ourselves. He has a nine-mile hike alone that he accomplishes in about uh, four hours over this range back to base camp. And he does it all the time. And at, at, when he got back to base camp, he packed up his tent, checked out, got in his car, drove to college. The season was over. Yep, the season was over. He was starting college the following Monday in Colorado, actually. <laughs> so now we're left, what do we do now? <laughs> Pull out the maps, pack up on our own, do everything by ourselves. And we did. And the kids did a fantastic job. They grew out of this experience uh, by leaps and bounds, and they became different people as a, as a, uh, as a result of this uh, trek. This is our, uh, one of our advisors, Dave Paul, who's here today. Uh, the, the third day, we had an opportunity to give back to Philmont uh, uh, in a little conservation project. These are conservation project leaders at a place called uh, Bobian. Uh, this is a chance for us to uh, get our hands dirty, put on our work gloves, and uh, our project was building a series of check dams. Uh, if you don't know what check dams are, here's a picture. Uh, you embed in, in a trail or a worn part of, the, uh, of a slope uh, these horizontal uh, obstacles so that water can slow down on its way down and not carve up the, uh, all of the sediment and take the sediment away, but rather to drop the sediment in these areas. And uh, it works very well. And they would have us place a log there. The ranger would look at it and say, not quite right. Take it out, do it again. And uh, we would do this for about three or four hours, and we got about, I'd say, four or five of them done. Uh, kids did a great job. And it wasn't until we got back we realized we actually had no pictures of the boys actually working on the trail. Because we were all working on the trail. No one thought to take pictures. And they did get a lot of work done. <clears throat> all right. This was the camp we stayed at at Black Mountain. That's the cabin that the employees stay at. There's about, over the summer, there are four to five guys living in that cabin. Uh, this camp was actually based on the concept of a Civil War militia. Um, there is no road into this camp. Okay? Everything that they have to use, they have to carry in on their back. There is a blacksmith that works at this camp, which means when he runs out of coal, they hike up the mountain, grab the coal that they've dumped by the side of the road, fill their backpacks, and carry it back down to camp. There were, when we were there, they were starting to close down. We were there at the very end of the season. So there was, I think, four guys there now. When we were there, one left that morning. Right. This was a sign we saw at almost every camp. This was a very active summer for, for bears. And this was everywhere. Um, active bears. Anytime that they have actively seen a bear in a camp, they post this to remind the kids, you have to put up your food. You can't have anything in your tent. If you leave anything in your tent, the bear will come in to get it. Okay. Yes, but they're going to go to the easiest food they can find. Oh, yeah. okay. and, and most of these bears have learned a lot of times when they see tents, it means food. 
bears are very, very smart animals. Very smart animals. Uh, this, is, this is the morning after we uh, spent at the, the Mountain Man uh, camp. And these are the two gentlemen who showed us how to uh, shoot 1861 Springfield uh, rifles, black powder rifles. This is the reason we chose our itinerary. <laughs> next, next slide is showing some, uh, some action shots. And everybody hit the target. Yep. It was great. And before they pulled the trigger, they had to yell something manly. They make it fun. Uh, both the guns had names. One was Kate. One was, the other yeah, I think. Betsy, I think. Betsy. Yeah. You had to be nice. You had to call the guns by name. Treat them well. Um, the boys act learned actually how to reload the black powder um, and how to fire. And everyone did hit the target at least once. We did very well. And they were loud. Were they loud? Yeah. Oh, there we go. Uh, this, just for an example, a lot of times when it's time for a break, there is no real room to get off the side of the trail. You kind of sit where you are. Um, this was on, I think, the only day that we really had any serious rain. And this was kind of an interlude. And this is on the trail outside of the Black Mountain Camp from the Black Powder. Consistently climbing most of the day. Um, this is the stream that we were following. We crossed this stream about nine times. And the, the trail just went back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. The reason for that is that there's very little maintenance done on, on this part of the trail. Uh, they do it at the beginning of the season, but during the season, you will get weather and you will get felled trees right across the trail, forcing the trail to meander in ways you never expected it to go. And uh, that's the reason we crossed the stream so many times. There's two of the scouts. They just went on the other side of the stream, but there's a little more room to sit down. No problem with poison ivy and things like that? Poison ivy. There is no poison ivy up, up where we were. Really? There was not poison ivy there. Another reason to go to New Mexico. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There's no poison ivy in Mexico? Uh, there may be in parts, but not on this mountain range. No, there isn't. They, they, they yeah. told us you will not need uh, to worry about poison ivy. It's just a different climate, dry air, and it's just wonderful. No bugs. No bugs. No bugs. No, no, bugs no need for bug repellent. Yep. This is one friend that greeted us in uh, uh, our fifth night, uh, and the, the deer are not afraid. They hang around and they commune with you. He hung around for about an hour around our camps. They just walked around us and around us, and we, we were, this is a mule deer in full velvet. Just an amazing sight to see. Okay, this is the view from the top of Mount Phillips. At this point, we're at 11,726 feet. This was a heck of a climb for a 51-year-old guy, let me tell you. Air is thin. <laughs> Air is thin. When you're used to about 800 feet above sea level, there's a huge difference in oxygen content. <laughs> we all made it. Uh, very rocky. You're just about a tree line here. There's the crew at the top. This is the one. These are the two photos, group photos I'm in, because I actually set the camera down on a rock. I was going to carry a tripod with me, and I said to myself, nah. They're, they're standing. Uh, there's, there, it's right here. They're standing on, next to a pile of rocks. And very often, on, the, on an elevation such as this, you can't tell where the trail is, except to look for uh, places where rocks have been kicked around and these pylons of piled rocks where they actually, every couple hundred feet, they mark the trail. A rock cairn. Now this is a panoramic view that I, sh I shot. This was actually with my phone. Um, and I, I wish it had come out better because I had two scouts that decided to be funny. And if you notice, it's hard to tell. But there's two scouts about here, here, and here, it's the same two scouts. <laughs> As I was panning, they would step until I was by them, and then they'd run real quick and then make another pose, and then they'd run real quick and make another pose. <laughs> that was uh, our cloning exercise. Uh, Philippe, Dora, and Matthew Goodwin that did that. 
This is, this is an interesting, uh, looks like the spine of an animal coming out of the velvet uh, of, of all the conifers up there. This gives you a nice view of the highest peak, which is Baldy Mountain, uh, and, and some of the other uh, uh, Sangre de Cristo range. Uh, this is one of those 50-mile views that you just kind of take in. And this, this is interesting because the first part of the day, we're looking at the mountain that we're going to be climbing over to get to our campsite in this valley. And you can kind of just um, be amazed at the amount of traveling that you actually do on foot. And another uh, beautiful shot, we're up on a mountain peak looking down into the valley. Uh, this is where the town of Cimarron is up here. And uh, at night, you would see the, the lights of Cimarron, like Christmas lights. It was amazing. Question? How many miles did you actually hike? Uh, this trek, uh, the, the question is how many miles did we hike? The trek was rated for 44 miles of, li of uh, trails, including switchbacks. Uh, some of us who went out of the way to get food at junctions in the middle of the trek and water probably did over 50 miles in seven days. It's a lot of hiking. You want to Another talk to you? This I is have a close-up. I just yeah. thought that was cool. I, I, I'm actually a geologist by training. So this was like heaven to me. I'm like, oh, that's cool. Um, it's just amazing. And, and I'm one of those people that I very rarely take pictures of people. I take pictures of rocks and plants and buildings. And, um, and that, that, that was just a, it's a cool formation that I liked in the rock. I'll, Rocks here are mainly igneous, mountain core. Okay, this is a panoramic from the top of the Tooth of Time. Uh, this was our last mountain we climbed, 9,600 feet. Um, and you can see the weather coming in. This is actually rain here, you can see. And we got, you get to the top and then you're climbing, boulder climbing to get to the top, basically. And some of the boys had made it to the peak my son was about 30 or 40 feet below the peak, and the heavens let loose. Rain, thunder, hail, Brimstone. you name it, it was coming at us. <laughs> now, my first thought as a Boy Scout leader is, okay, we have to get off the mountain. My second thought as a Boy Scout leader is, no, these guys worked for five days to get here. He's 40 feet away from the peak. I'm not telling him no. Okay. So we actually made it to the top. Um, we got to the top. Uh, uh, Mr. Jacoby and Mr. Paul had stayed back to watch the packs. We got to the top and our other leader, Sam Goodwin, decided to just scream because he was excited to be there. All they heard was someone screaming. <laughs> okay. They didn't know why. Uh, so we got to the top, took a picture quick, got down off the peak, and then we hunkered down. And uh, there's a lot of overhangs there. So the boys kind of, we hunkered down under the overhangs, waited at least for the hail to stop. And it was cold. It was probably right around 40 degrees with the wind, the rain, and the hail. And this was just prior to the beginning of the Trail of Tears. So we're, uh, we're now arrived at base camp, and we've made it. Um, these are some of our uh, hosts, our visitors. Uh, again, they're not afraid. Uh, they just kind of hang out with us. And we slept so well that night. <laughs> but the, the cruel joke is they have they, one part of base camp is for departing crews. One part of base camp is for returning crews. When we were in the departing crew part of camp, showers were hot. They were nice. We got to the returning. There was no hot water in the showers. <laughs> we're like, no, this is cruel. This is not nice. Uh, our, our last day there. Uh, we actually went to a museum. Um, this at one time was supposedly one of Kit Carson's homes. It's a Kit Carson museum. But there's like six Kit Carson museums in New Mexico. Um, and we did tomahawk throwing. Uh, this young lady here is actually the, the staff member there. And she taught the boys how to throw tomahawk. She did much better than the boys did. Uh, but most of the boys got one to stick. Now, this is the view of the Tooth of Time from the coming back towards base camp from the museum. This is the classic 
shot that when someone says the tooth of time, that's what people know. And this actually is a very famous mountain. This camp is actually on the Santa Fe Trail. And when they were traveling the Santa Fe Trail and they saw this peak, they knew they were two weeks out of Santa Fe. They used it as a guide point. So it's actually a very, very famous peak. And actually when I was there in 1978, we got to the top and I was sitting right about there with my legs hanging over the edge because it was a nice day that day, eating lunch, just watching the world go by. On the way back, here's, here, here, here. you see Mike in the back on there? <laughs> Mike was fun, Mike was fun. Uh, does anybody recognize this fountain? This is Chicago. We had a five hour layover in Chicago, so we decided to walk the city. It's also the fountain that's in the beginning of the show uh, Married with Children, if I remember correctly. Um, had a nice walk around Chicago. Chicago's a beautiful city. Um, we actually got the layover on the way there. On the way out, we were five and a half hours late to Chicago. We were supposed to have a six hour layover. We got there five and a half hours late. It took them 40 minutes to get us our baggage off the train. Um, but they're used to it, they hold the trains. And I think this one, this is our last shot. This is a picture that I wish I had taken. I did not take this picture. Mr. Jacoby took this picture. Yeah, and this, this is actually uh, eight scouts. I wish it was ours. I can't, tell, I can't tell you that it was us. It was actually a troop from Bangor, Maine. And they had just gotten up for the sunrise and they had a uh, church service. This is, this is, yep, Every, they're, they're from everywhere. Yes. Yes. Right. Yeah. Yep. What, what were they doing in Bengal, Maine, out, way out there? I, they come from all over the country. This is the pinnacle of scouting, is Philmont Scout Ranch. And, and this is them just enjoying the sunrise after they, uh, it's just a poignant picture. Uh, good one to end, end the slideshow. And, and the, the scouts actually have five high adventure camps at this point. Philmont. Um, Sea base. Sea base, which is in Florida. Uh, there's a canoeing base up in Minnesota, I think. They also have the new Scout Bechtel Reservation, which is a high adventure base. Uh, and that's where they're having the National Jamborees now. And they just actually opened a new one called Swamp Base, where you spend a week or two camping in the swamps. So, so where, are the, where are the Jamborees now? The Jamborees are in, at Bechtel. It's in, in West Virginia. West Virginia, yeah. The National Jamborees. So they moved it from Virginia? Uh, they moved it from the Army Base, yes. From Fort A.P. Hill. Yeah, yeah Fort A.P. Hill. I used to be a forester with the Virginia Department of Forestry. Yeah. So that was one of our big highlights for yeah. the Jamboree. You know, all of us foresters for the state were there to equip the Boy Scouts. Yeah. So at this point, we've uh, completed our slideshow and hope you had a, a good hike today. Um, and, and I don't know if we have time for uh, a question or two? Questions Would you like to we'll open that up for a question? Yep. Terry. I have a question for the scouts. Yeah. Would you do it again? Yeah. 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 <laughs> repeat, repeat, repeat the question, guys. But, uh, <laughs> at, that was asked if uh, the scouts would do it again, would, would go on another trek in their lifetime. Soon? Maybe? My, Maybe not so far. <laughs> my, my favorite part of the trip was I went when I was 15. 1978. I went this time with my son who was 15 now. We had just finished the trek. We had just gotten off the Trail of Tears and it is literally a Trail of Tears. It's tough. It's a hard walk because you're walking towards base camp and then you're walking away from base camp. But when you get down, you're, it's, it's a great feeling. And we're in base camp and I was walking with my son and he looked up at that picture of the tooth of time and he goes, Dad, we were on top of that mountain four hours ago. That's cool. Yeah. We Any have other questions. We have uh, a display back here in the back room that we welcome you to talk to some of the scouts that actually uh, did this. And thank you all for your attention. Oh, one more question. Yep.
Springwater Trails. And Springwater, the town of Springwater is located near Canadice and Hemlock Lakes. Um, and we have a system of trails down there. We hike once a week. And we have a website and a brochure if anybody's interested. And thank you very much again. Uh, I'm Ed Linskook. I'm their unit commissioner. I did this trek. I led a trek in 1984 with my youngest son. Uh, I climbed Mount Baldy. You got a much better view than Mount Phillips. Uh, we did There's 100 no trees on top of Mount Baldy. We did 100 miles in eight days. Yep. So there's just something to shoot for. We had pack burrows. We did horseback riding. And there's a lot of there great is. stuff. There's a coal mine on the place or, or some kind of a mine on the place. Or a gold mine. Yeah. We scratched the surface in terms of things you can do. When, when I went in 78, we also, uh, our crew, um, went straight for the hardest truck there. And we, had, we were on trail for 10 days, two layovers. We did 110 miles in eight days of walking. The question is, did we ever camp with another group? We did. Yes. Uh, rem very remotely. Uh, we were aware of uh, one other group in our camp site, general camp area, and we visited with them occasionally, but they were up at uh, like 5.30 to get to Mount Phillips, and we decided to do it the next, the, day. The next day and that kind of a thing. We actually so, had what's called a sister crew. There was yeah. a crew that was on the same truck that we were. That's the crew I was talking yeah. about. Yeah. Yeah. But not a lot of action at that time of the season. The yeah. place is closing down. Yeah. And you, you know it. You come back and you're, you're one of maybe 10 crews having dinner at the mess hall. Yeah. The place is pretty deserted. It's, it's peak time is uh, July and beginning of August. Yes? Are there similar uh, adventure type, uh, you probably don't know, for the Girl Scouts? Yes. Uh, the, the, not only do they invite uh, Boy Scouts, but they also invite venturing crews. Unfortunately, by, uh, they require, there's a minimum age requirement of either 13 years completing the eighth grade for boys, and I think it may be the same for girls, uh, or uh, 14 years of age. Kind of used to be down here, but that's mild compared to what you were doing. Yes, right. And, and uh, they would invite us to bring uh, females as members of our crew. The only requirement is that they provide a female leader as well. Yep. So we're, we're open to that as Boy Scout troops to, to bring uh, Girl Scouts with us, absolutely. But are there particular areas that Girl Scouts, that somebody probably left land to Girl Scouts somewhere along the line too? That, that I don't know. Not sure. That I don't know. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for listening.